Hello, everyone. Um, welcome. Thank you, Andrea, for joining us and helping us uh, with interpretation today. My name is Cassidy Diamond. I am the Public Programs and Events Manager at uh, the IDA, um, and really glad you all can join us today. Uh, I'm coming to you from Los Angeles, which is on the unceded land of the Tongva and Chumash people, who have been stewards of this land for generations. Um, before we begin, I'd like to thank our media sponsor, IndieWire, uh, for your support and also KC, KCRW for your support in bringing screening series to all of our audiences. Uh, to that end, you can find out uh, more about our screening series if you're just kind of stumbling upon us. Um, you can find out more about our, our lineup at documentary.org slash screening series. I'll just let Andrea catch up because I know that's a long one. Um, and then you're not here to see me. So I'm going to hand this over to Eric Cohn from IndieWire, who's going to be our intrepid uh, moderator for the evening. Hi, Eric. Hi, thanks for having me. And uh, thank you all for tuning in. The film, which is my handy background here, is one that I think uh, is not only a, a wonderful kind of cinematic experience, but one that opens up some really remarkable conversations about how limited our understanding of the world is when we live in places that are far away from other places. And in this particular case, I think about the history of the documentary form ever since the days of Robert Flaherty, there, the documentary form has been used as a means of sort of exploring cultures that are foreign to its viewers. And what Truffle Hunters does is it really brings us a world that is so alien, but by the time you watch the film, you feel like you know it from the inside out. And so the access that they got to make this film tells a story in itself. And we're gonna hear a bit about that from the filmmakers. So I'd like to welcome them now. Please uh, join me in applauding from your living room for directors Michael Dweck and Gregory Kershaw. Hey, everybody. And you can hear that applaud. Hey. <laughs> it's, loud. It's, loud. Oh, it's great to be here. Thank you, Eric. It's Thank great. you. Thank you, IDA. Thank, Thank you for being here. So. Let's start with the obvious question on all this because uh, the two of you have made documentaries on a wide range of subjects before. This wouldn't have been a, a topic that I would automatically assume based on your other work you had immediate familiarity with. So tell us a bit about how you discovered these characters in the world that they live in. Well, Gregory and I are both um, curious about communities um, and communities that are steeped in tradition. Um, and <laughs> communities that haven't been that affected with the pull of the modern world. And um, we, um, when we finished editing our last film in August of 2017, The Last Race, we were both separately looking for a place to go with our families just to chill out and relax after you know, five years of making that film. And by coincidence, we ended up in the exact same region in Northern Italy. We're just looking for a place with just no tourists in a small village and, uh, and that would be away from the sea. We ended up in this in this place, this area called Manfredato. And um, it, it, we spoke to each other a couple of weeks after that and learned that we had both been in the same place. And we started to talk about what was unusual about this place, that it was almost like to both of us, like a fairy tale. Um, it was, um, you know, it, it's a place that didn't seem touched by modernity. Um, and it was also a place that was keeping a secret. You know, we started to talk to people in the town. They were saying, what are, you, what are you doing here? You should be here in November, not August. And said, why November? And they said, well, it's truffle season. And we started to ask about truffles. Who gets these things? And all we heard was, well, we don't know. We don't know who gets them. They're just these men we hear about in the mountains and no one's ever seen them or heard about them. But when we want one, we put like 50 euros in a little wooden box outside a cafe. And miraculously, the next morning, a truffle appears. And that's all we know. And of course, that piqued our curiosity. And we ended up coming back and, uh, and spending well, turned out to be uh, three years making this film, but it took a good part of a year getting into the community to really find out who the community was. And uh, in terms of access, how did you first sort of engage these characters who, as far as we can tell, are so far removed from uh, you know, society as we know it that the idea of being stars of a movie must have been, you know, <laughs> hard for them to conceive. Well, yeah, I don't, I mean, the thing is that at first we, we couldn't engage them. We couldn't find them. That would, so 
it took, you know, there were, we heard about truffle hunters. We talked to restaurateurs, we'd go into a restaurant and yeah. And the, the chef would tell us that he gets truffles every day, just like Mike said. And um, we'd ask him to introduce us and he'd say, no, no way. And in, you know, in a lot of cases, he didn't even really know the guy it was. And so that we, it took a lot of time just meeting people in these communities. We'd meet, you know, one person who, you know, a, a, a guy who would own a cafe would say, would introduce us to his uncle who would introduce us to a priest and who, who might know a truffle hunter. And then we'd ask him if we could meet the truffle hunter and he'd say, no, oh, no, 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 no. And, and really we had to, we had to make a lot of friends in this area. And little by little, we started getting introduced to some of the truffle hunters. And, but then there was this whole, yeah, then we had to enter into their world. We had to become friends with them and gain their trust. And that was, I think, why the, the film took so long because before we really could start rolling the camera and before we could start really doing the filmmaking, we had to build relationships, build friendships with the people that we were filming. We had, a, you know, we had a lot of, we shared meals with them. We drank a lot of red wine and a lot of espresso and we talked to them and learned about their lives and, and explained to them what, what we hoped to do with them. And I, I think they, they, they're, they're very humble people that we filmed with. Um, and I don't think they think of their lives as being extraordinary as we immediately did when we came into contact with them. But they, they also realize that they have something very special in this world. They see that all the changes that are happening in the world around them and they, they've held on to this connection with nature. They've held on to this con connection with their communities, with their families. And I think they know that, that is, that's really rare in the world right now. And I, th I think there was a desire to, to share that with the world. So we would film a little bit and we would show them. And I think they, they saw how we wanted to express their world, ex express how we felt it. And I think ultimately that's sort of what won them over. But it was, yeah, it was a long process of breaking, you know, breaking, breaking through these many layers of secrecy that, that protect this very hidden world. And there were a lot of fake truffle hunters that the touristy truffle hunters had a uniform and a badge and they would, you know, plant truffles in the ground and a, a dog would find them and then, you know, people would pay a lot of money and have dinner, but they weren't the real, they weren't the real truffle hunters, real truffle hunters. I mean, they imagine these are like 90 year old men that walk 20 miles a night in the dark with no lights at all on cliffs and in the, in the cold and with a dog and uh, with nobody else around. And there's also these occasional 400 pound giant wild boars that would just come out and <laughs> go right by us. It was, uh, it was, and we couldn't keep up with them either. It was, it was that was a challenge. They so kept complaining that we were too slow. Well, so, so how did you detect those, uh, the phonies? How could you tell? I mean, I, I'm sure those people would love to have their stories on, on camera. Right? <laughs> oh, yeah. It was, oh yeah. It, it was very, it was very obvious. It was obvious. That was, it was obvious. Yeah. That, that was the first, those were the first people we met, you know, right off, you know, we started talking, talking to the, the people that sold truffles and th these were the people that they were very easy to meet. And we met them, you know, within the first week of being there and um, they're very, very nice people, but yeah, they have a shtick, they have tourists come plant the truffle and people leave, you know, feeling like they, and they have to some extent kind of seeing how a truffle comes out of the ground, but it's, it's, it's very different from the people that we filmed with the people that we filmed with. Yeah. They, 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 don't want they don't want people to know it's just everything about this world everything is a secret where the truffles are found where they're sold how much you know the mystery of how much they sell for on any, on any given day i mean it's all it's 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 all it's all happens under the cover of night and that's you know i guess that's what that's what got us so curious about it there's like there's this mystery and then the and then of course there is the the, the actual footage that you capture of this sort of sacred hunt because it's one thing to kind of gain at find these people and gain access to their homes talk to them about what they do <laughs> getting the camera past that point what what was that process like how long did that take I, I don't think we they ever took us to the real spots anyway I mean they dragged <laughs> us around a lot I mean we were out we would still think we'd start every night at midnight and uh and they would drag us through the woods. Sometimes the first time they took us, it was down the cliff where we thought we were gonna die. There was no way. We took maybe, we went maybe, I don't know, 30 meters down and we looked at each other and said, we had heavy, we had really heavy cameras with us and it was muddy and it raining and we were sliding and there was no branches to hold onto and it was like 2000 feet down. And the truffle hunter was ahead of us screaming, you're too slow, move. <laughs> and we're like, and I said to Greg, we're gonna die, there's no way. 
because the sound guy was above us. And he was like, and he was, he had no sh- his shoes were really like no tread and he was sliding and he had to take <laughs> me out and Greg and then the truffle hunter. And then he's like, give me the camera, give me the camera. So of course we're like, oh, oh really? No. And of course he took the camera and uh, you know, $150,000 camera dragged it down the mountain and they came back and get the tripod and it got us. But it was, you know, <laughs> they, so made us pay, they made us pay our dues. You know, we had a we had to pay our dues, and that was part of it. And uh, and I also think that word word got around that we were uh, you know part of their part of their family. There was one, I think the the one, the first time we actually tasted a truffle was probably the time that got us into the community. It was we went out, we were out all night, and it hadn't rained in a long time. The first year we were there, and uh, this truffle hunter we were with Johnny had finally got a truffle. It was maybe this big, and let's say it'd be worth seventy five dollars. But he'd been looking for weeks and found nothing and he found one with us uh so we thought he was just going to go to the road the sun had come up and he was going to go to the road and just sell it to our truffle drug dealer I mean, he's not a drug dealer a truffle dealer but looks like a drug dealer um john franco and uh instead he took us to his cabin he said come come with me and we went to his a little wooden cabin and he threw in some you know some wood into his his uh stove and uh went out and got some eggs from his chickens and put it into a you know like a, a cast iron skillet like eight eggs and then we still didn't know what he was doing. And then he put it into you know three dishes and then shaved that truffle and said, this is for you, welcome into my family. And that was our first time that uh, we felt we were, we were kind of in. And then word spread because he was friends with Angelo, the guy in the typewriter. Everybody was kind of connected after that and that, uh, and that helped us quite a bit. Now, now I think that, uh, I, I was just gonna say, I think the, the, the GoPros also were kind of a, we didn't intend to use that as sort of a secret device to find the spots and to, to see them in action, well, to see the truffle hunters where they were really digging up the truffles, we wanted to bring you into the dog's perspectives. But we would let, we would put these go, little GoPro cameras on these mounts that we actually, we had, we had them made by, we tried all these, tried all different ways to get the dog cam working. And we, we tried these little fancy gimbals that we bought. And it, we ended up working with an Italian cobbler to make little harnesses that comfortably went on each of the dog's head. We had little harnesses for each of the dogs and we put the GoPro on there and, but we would let them, we would let them run for, you know, as long as the card would last. So sometimes we'd have two hours of footage and we would see, we would not only see where they were really truffle hunting, Mm -hmm. but we would also see this really incredible relationship that, that the truffle hunters have with their dogs. And we would see that the truffle hunters, they, they would have conversations with their dogs. Well, they're, I mean, they're alone in the middle of the woods in complete darkness. And they would start talking to them about what was going on that night. Sometimes talking to them sort of about deeper things, as, as, as you see in the film, like Aurelio really has their one-sided conversations, at least verbally. But they're, they're, he's telling the dog, he really has conversations with, with, he has conversations with his dog. But then we, w- we would also see that there were, there were things that they were saying with their dogs that words they were using that we didn't understand and we had never heard. And we asked our translator if they were in Piedmontese and she said, no, I've never heard them. And we realized that each of the truffle hunters had their own special language with their dogs. Just by being, they, they go out into the woods in the middle of the night for hour, eight hours, completely alone. And just by virtue of spending so much time together, they've developed this 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 unique language, this unique way of communicating. So all their commands are unique to that particular dog. And so it's, we, we really came to understand the depth of these relationships that, that the people we filmed with have with their dogs through, through this camera that was really, you know, initially just about fi- showing the audience the, the dog's perspective on the world. Right. Well, and the other thing that's, that, that um, sort of leads up to is that there is this tragic moment where, where the, this guy loses his, his mm-hmm. companion and, and I, I wonder, you know, what it was like for you to capture that side of things, especially with a subject basically revealing, you know, the intensity of that bond on camera. Yeah. Well, whenever you'd mention a, a dog to one of the truffle hunters and the dog wasn't present, they would just cry. Not even a dog had passed away, but just to mention the dog, just say, how is Berba? And it's just they just well up and just start crying in front of you. And that's how, same with Sergio. Sergio is very emotional. Um, they all have a really unique connection with their dogs. And with Sergio, uh, who had lost you know, one dog and the other one, was, both were poisoned. And we were aware of that because that season where, the, where it hadn't rained in months, it was really competitive. There was a, you know, the price had, had soared 
there was you know a lot of Russians and Chinese. There was a demand for them to ship all this stuff overseas, and uh, and there was now poisoning. They were taking you know making poison meatballs and putting them in the woods and uh, and um, and he was prepared for that. I mean, he thought he did. He had you know hydrogen peroxide with him, and they have a lot of them carry salt. And if you know they try to have the dog, but. But it was, you know, it was just, it was too late. And it was uh, for him devastating. It still is. If you've mentioned God, every time we just mention that dog or anybody mentions it, who doesn't even know the dog passed away, he just, just, just cries for like an hour. So, because a lot of them don't have children. A lot of them have lived their wives and or their children have moved away. And, uh, and this is kind of you know, all they have. Like Aurelio, the first time we went to his house, he invited us for lunch. There were four plates. And there were only three of us, including Aurelio. But we realized <laughs> that he was making soup and sausages, and Berba was the fourth plate. Hmm. It wasn't like a dog dish; it was a plate. It was a porcelain plate, and Berba hopped up first, and Berba got served first, and then the rest of us got served. Uh, and it was, you know, and then his conversation that followed was really interesting about Christmas and what he's going to prepare for for Christmas dinner for Berba. That's amazing. I mean, one of the things that's fascinating about this movie is that it, it starts with the premise and you think you kind of understand what it's about. And then there are all these intricate connections that kind of unfold from there. Another one is the complexity behind the scenes of, of what brings food to your table. And uh, while, you know, I'm, Mike, on the post poster behind you, you have that pull quote, it's this eccentric world you've never heard of, never seen. And yet, I think a lot of us feel like we kind of know what truffles are as, as as a starting point you know i have truffle salt and truffle oil in my kitchen but mm -hmm. you have this scene of you know the, this this gentleman sitting there sniffing a truffle and then you know it feels like minutes on end where we watch the whole thing kind of prepared for him in this very lavish way and mm -hmm. i'm curious to hear a bit about how you approach the decision to track the process beyond the hunt the the kind of mm -hmm. ecosystem that leads these things to the table. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that immediately when we were when we started exploring this world, we were struck by by how there are these these two really different worlds that that have a, this connection with the truffle. They're connected by the truffle, but they're totally they're running parallelly to each other, and they rarely touch. There's a you know, there's the world of the consumer, and it, you know in this town there's in the in the center of Alba, which is sort of the center of the truffle trade, there's really high end restaurants that um, three star Michelin chefs and millionaires and billionaires fly in to eat at these restaurants and, and spend outrageous sums for truffles. Um, and then you have the truffle producer, the, tr the truffle hunters and these worlds, it's they're right next to each other. They're, they're operating, you know, they're operating just, you know, miles, sometimes, you know, sometimes just just uh, you know, city streets away from each other, but they don't they don't really intersect. Gianfranco, the truffle seller in the film, is sort of the the connection between those worlds. But I think that those those two worlds, it was the juxtaposition of those two worlds was so fascinating. And we might see both of those worlds in any given day. We you know we might be with the judge experiencing him eating you know a, in a truffle meal in a, in a michelin starred restaurant with drinking barolo wine and then we that same night we'd be out in the woods with our you know with the mud up to our mud up to our ankles searching for truffles and i mean there, within the film there, there's there is uh you know there's there's a critique of how that market works the truffle the truffle hunters get very little for it um and and they that the truffles end up selling for a lot of money but there's there's also this passion that both of the worlds have like Gianfranco the truffle dealer is is just as passionate about finding the best truffle as the truffle hunters are I mean there was this the, one day we were with him at lunch and we he got a call that another truffle seller had sold it was almost like a kilo it was a huge truffle it was almost like a kilo to somebody else in the area another chef and Gianfranco immediately got up and he was he was he was enraged because he has a reputation for getting the best and the biggest truffles. So he went to the person that had bought the truffle, bought it back so he could sell it to somebody else. Cause he wants, he, he wants to have the best. He, he's, uh, he's obsessive about that. And um, I think we, you know, with the, in the case with Paolo, the judge, I mean, he, when you share it, when we would share a meal with him, the way he experienced wine, the way he experienced food, it was, 
it, it that that's what brought him bliss the same kind of bliss that our the truffle hunters felt so we it was all it was different worlds but i guess it was all the same story to us it was all it was all about this passion i think we wanted to show the oh sorry we wanted to show the contrast that you know how modernity has transformed you know our lives and the contrast between that and their lives because there's the world has now become a lot of its sameness and uh due to demands of the modern world and you get to see you know the contrast to the world of the, of the truffle hunters at the exact same at parallels as greg was saying yeah and and the other thing that i think is notable about that is that it's it's a gradual accumulation to 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 kind of get around to that point and you don't lay it all out. There are a lot of more conventional documentary approaches one can envision for this subject, more title cards, talking heads, getting some experts, that sort of thing. Let's talk a bit about the, the approach that you did take, which is much more of sort of this slow burn lyrical immersion into that environment. How, at what point did you sort of kind of settle on that approach and, and start to figure out the way that you wanted it to, uh, to come across as you were shooting? I think um, it, the world actually told us um, what it should be. We, you know, we, because we spent so much time there with them, with the families, um, that was the most important. I think we probably spent, I don't know, maybe six months before we started to shoot anything. Um, and it, it was also, the world was also telling us to slow down and, um, and to observe. Uh, and I think, you know, we, you know, we compose these, uh, the frames, we composed it in a way that would allow the action to unfold in front of the camera. Uh, and we thought that was, you know, in a way quite pure. So we, you know, we would also, we wanted to disappear. And we, we because we're there so often, just hanging out with them and having meals with them and sharing experiences with them, they kind of forgot about us. And that, and that, and we're also a very, very small crew. It's Greg and I, cinematographers and then we have a sound person who kind of disappears and a live translator but we're also just hiding behind you know the camera and uh and we just would also all the scenes that were that were that were filmed were all things that were part of their lives naturally like when you see maria and carlos sitting at a dinner table that table everything happens at the same time that that world's all full of rituals uh, so that we knew 12 noon they're going to sit there and they're also going to have that same conversation most likely every day because Maria does not want Carla to truffle hunt anymore because now he's 88 years old and he could risk losing the farm if he just gets hurt. Um, so we just, you know, we, we just sit and, and wait and we shoot one shot a day at the most. And a lot of times no shots a day because we didn't feel the opportunity was there. Um, and then we would just let the camera roll for, an hour, hour and a half, two hours, as long as the cards had, uh, the cards lasted. And, uh, and then there was the job, of course, of, you know, of finding the moments that kind of worked for our, for our story. But we didn't even know a story when we started to film it all until, until kind of the very end. Well, I, we also, go ahead. Oh, just one thing. Yeah, we, you know, we, I guess we approached the film too. We weren't, we weren't looking for facts. That was never our interest as when we started this film. It, it was kind of, it was looking for, I guess, an emotional truth, a, a, a truth and sort of feeling. And that was, from the beginning, that was sort of what we wanted to share with our audience. We wanted to share share the, the truth of our subjective experience of being in this world, what it, what it, what it felt like and, and what it, you know, what it, what it sounded like also hopefully what it tasted like and what it's, you know, what it smelled like and what the, you know, what the, what the feel of the dirt felt like under your feet. We wanted to create, you know, the goal was to create a cinematic experience where you could, where you could get a little bit of all that. And that was, that was sort of the, the starting place for everything. And the stories, yeah, as Mike's saying, they, they just sort of, they, we didn't have a, uh, any idea of a story. We didn't really have any idea of, you know, the themes or even who these truffle hunters would be when we started. And, and that all just came from, from meeting these people and learning about their lives and then spending time with them so that, well, what was happening in their lives became, that was the story. That's, and that was, ended up being what the film was about. And that's where the themes came from. Also, um, the other thing that, that I think is, is notable for this project, just in terms of its cinematic qualities, is that you're, you've got the stamp of approval from Luca Guadagnino. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> 
somebody who, you know, if you're looking for validation, making a movie in Italy and not being Italian, you can't do that <laughs> these days. So what was his involvement here and, and, you know, what kind of guidance did he provide for you on the project? Well, Luca makes artful films for a broad audience and takes a lot of chances. And, uh, and that's something that attracted us. And um, one of our EPs on the film uh, heard that Luca was interested in just in truffles because he, he owns a truffle dog. We found out a, a uh, um, it's a Ramagnola, a Ramagnola dog. And uh, he also has a piece of land he bought in a truffle region somewhere. We don't know where yet, but uh, he has an interest in that. And he also, you know, we sent him, we sent him some pieces of the film we shot early on, like a little bit of a scissor reel. And he, he called us and said he thought it was, uh, you know, very beautiful in, in many ways. And, and then he had a long conversation with us about, you know, uh, about what we, what we had in mind. And, and he, uh, he came along for the ride. He's, he's looked at our cuts. He gave us notes. Um, he's been helpful. You know, we, you know, we, we speak to him, you know, try to speak to him every, you know, every few weeks, but he's been, uh, he's been super helpful. It's interesting hearing that, that he, you know, bought, bought attractive land. Cause I imagine those who do for their film like this, it's, it's kind of a form of research. And, uh, and I wonder what, you took away from it about just how endangered this environment is because watching it, it's hard not to think about broader conversations related to climate change and, and you know, mm -hmm. sustainability. So wh what, do you, what did you sort of glean from that side of things about just how fragile this environment is? Well, I think that was another, that was something else that came, you know, from our experience there. We, we didn't, the environmental aspect of the film, I think that it came out because we were spending time with people whose lives are just, they're so connected with the land on a daily basis. They, they, you know, Carlo, who's 88 years old, he's worked on the same farmland his entire life and he's still out working. This is just working on his farm in the fields every day. He, and then he goes out truffle hunting all night. I mean, I, I don't know how he does it, but he's, experience he's been on this land for so long that he's seen these changes in in the weather in the climate i mean he talks about when he was when he was a, a young boy he would follow his father as he was plowing the fields and truffles would pop up sometimes like potatoes i mean they were that plentiful and now it's i mean it's nearly impossible i mean that's what the film is about it's nearly impossible to find a truffle and i you know that's we've come to understand i think that's for a lot of reasons it's it's Climate change is, is probably one of the biggest ones because these, these truffles, they can't be cultivated. They depend on these, the white truffle depends on these very, very specific conditions. And that's why it only grows in this, this thin strip of land that's mostly in Italy, but some of the other, some of the other neighboring countries also. And there's also deforestation and agricultural mm -hmm. pollution. So, so this, there's this kind of crazy confluence of factors that are that are resulting in fewer and fewer truffles every year but at the same time there's the demand is is skyrocketing it's no longer a local delicacy it's no longer a european delicacy but everybody in the united states wants truffles now and people in asia want truffles now in russia and and and, and the demand is growing exponentially at the same time that there are fewer so there's a tremendous pressure on the land that produces them and and the few people that really have the skills and the dogs and the knowledge to be able to pull them out of the ground. But that, that's one of the reasons why poisonings have become this, this unthinkable thing that somebody would do to a dog. I mean, especially when you understand the relationship that a truffle hunter has to a dog, to think that somebody could do that, it's, it's just, it's really hard to fathom, but that's become, it's becoming more and more common because the demands are just so, so insane. Greg mentioned uh, this deforestation, and um, the, you know everything is considered public land in Italy when it comes to truffle hunting. You can truffle hunt anybody's property, and that's also what leads to to conflicts. So, I mean, in, in one night, you know, we were called. Uh, it was like four o'clock in the morning. Sergio called, so you have to come down here now. Someone's destroying my forest. He calls it my forest. He doesn't own the land, but it's a public forest. And we got there, and somebody had just two people with chainsaws for firewood had just cut down 200 year old oak trees, two acres worth in, in 20 minutes. They were, they were decimated. And uh, so, so we realized how fragile that, that, that is. And also we realized through the truffle hunters that trees also communicate one another. So if you cut one tree down, that tree actually will, the other tree will stop producing. And also how you respect the land when you take a truffle up, if you don't 
if you don't wait till it's mature. During the film, you see them smelling the land constantly. And that's because they want to see is it, is it mature or not, because you know, if the spores, spores don't develop, it'll, it won't come back year after year. Um, so we also have a, a conservation program. We've, uh, we've, raised, we've raised a, a good bit of money and, uh, and we're going to uh, be uh, acquiring land. Well, they'll, we're giving it to their trust that they have. They already have this conservation program. And they'll be they'll be acquiring almost all the land where we where we filmed a lot of the a lot of the films. So that deforestation uh, you know will never happen, hopefully. So bring us up to speed on, on what happened after you wrapped uh, shooting. Where you know where are all these characters now, and and um, you know how how have things been going for everyone? Well, we we shared the the film at Sundance. That was the premiere, and. January and we we immediately planned on going to Italy to to share it with the people that we filmed with after but uh, I guess the, the world had different plans for us and um, everybody we've all been locked away waiting waiting this thing out but um, our we our truffle hunters well we, we got some 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 very sad news um, that uh, Aurelio in the film he he passed recently he had uh, wasn't COVID he um, he he was actually in great shape, and he was he had just moved into a new apartment. Our our co producer who um, who who looks after him down there and helps him out a lot. She um, she had just moved him into a new place. He had called her and said he had never been so happy in his life. And uh, the next day he just he was driving and he had a heart attack out of nowhere. Um, so we we lost we lost him, and uh, it makes bringing this film out into the world very I guess very you know, bit, bittersweet. Um, but the, the rest of the guys are, they're doing great. I mean, I think they, they're, they live very isolated lives in general. So they're with their families, they're out in nature. And um, so far, everybody else has been really, really healthy. And we're, we're hoping if, uh, if the world allows, we're planning on being back there to no, in November to, to share it with them um, in a, in a, in a, theater where we can have everybody socially distanced and uh, give them a chance to see it on the big screen because we think that's that's important and we really want to celebrate their their involvement in this. One of the things that's notable about this is that you know it's not like you just made a little art project and showed it in a university or something I mean this film premiered at one of the most prominent festivals in the world. It was acquired by Sony Pictures Classics. It was part of the Cannes official selection even though Cannes didn't really happen. How much do you think these characters, these subjects, understand the sort of scale of the thing that, that they've been involved with now that it's a, a completed work out in the world? I don't think, I don't think they know, um, but uh, I think once we kind of get there, we're gonna you know, show them the, the poster and um, you know, they have no access to, to press, which is probably a good thing. Um, so they don't really, they really know. But I think once they see it on the screen, I think they'll, they'll probably realize the, the, the magnitude of what they were part of. But it's hard because they're, they don't, they're not really exposed to, they only do, they, they read the newspaper, they go to town maybe twice a week to, to pick up maybe meat because they're pretty self-sufficient. And then they share a newspaper around the table, the whole town. <laughs> so so their, their information is, uh, you know, few and far between. But, um, but hopefully from this, I mean, they'll be, you know, They'll, uh, uh, they'll feel really good about their lives, I think, and see how we filmed them as being really heroic. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I, I think this, the, I think the film has the potential to change their lives, but I don't, I, I, I can't imagine any of them wanting their lives to change. Um, I think they're all, they're all very content with where they are and what they have. And um, I mean, I think they're happy to see their, their world transmitted, but I don't mm -hmm. think they would, I don't think if they had, the means to, I don't, to, to, to more money or to, I don't know, to whatever fame could bring. Like, I don't, I don't think they would go after it. I think they're very content with where they are. So what you feel when you're there, you always feel like you're part of the community and because they don't, they, they speak to people. They're connected in a way that we're not, like we think, you know, because of how we connect with each other socially through technology, we always thought before we got there, Greg and I, that, that we were really connected, but we realized how connected that community is really through just traditional communication, talking, uh, leaving notes for people, reading papers. Um, we had a, we were, at one point we were looking for a pregnant truffle dog to film, which was, we thought we were really easy, but of course it, was, it wasn't easy. And, uh, and I remember we traveled, we asked somebody in a, at a veterinarian in one town 
And he said, I don't know, but I'll, I'll ask around. And we drove about 35 miles to a different town and we ended up stopping at a, a, a cafe to have something to drink. And as soon as we walked in, the woman from behind the counter said to us, are you the guys looking for the pregnant truffle dog? <laughs> We're like, yeah. He said, okay, we have, a, we have a dog. Here's his phone number and a piece of paper. Call him, he's ready for your call. He's ready to do it, just like that. And that was, that was, that was typical, exactly how, that, how this film came about. Everybody was you know, communicating in a very traditional sense and, uh, and it seemed very, very well connected. And once we were in that world, though, things became easier for us. Just to bring this conversation full circle, Greg, you talked about um, the impact, the potential impact this documentary could have on the lives of, of the men you filmed, but what kind of impact beyond that do you, would you like to see it have or do you expect it could have both in Italy for this tradition and, you know, abroad, given that, you know, this is going to have an international audience? Yeah. I, well, I, I mean, there's specifically, I guess there's the impact program that, that Mike talked about where we are going to be um, helping local organizations acquire forest land. But I, I think the, the bigger thing with this film, it's, um, I don't know, I, I guess it maybe the, the way to answer that is to talk about sort of what we got about it, what we got from filming. It's just when you're, when you're with people who, who have lives that are, I mean, they, they're so rich and they're so, they're so filled with joy. I mean, it, it was just, it was, we were constantly, they were, it was, it was just like they were filled with mirth and there was laughter and it was infectious. And that's hopefully what, what the film transmits. But you look at like, how, why are they that way? And it, like, what do they have? What do they have that, that, you know, we might be missing in our lives? And I mean, I think one of the first things that we discovered is just that they're not, their lives are not overtaken by digital technology. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they, they don't carry cell phones in their pockets that, are constantly giving them all sorts of messages and give them access to all the information in the world at any moment. Like, I think immediately, like that gives them a certain peace. And mm -hmm. then it's this connection to nature, this mm -hmm. time spent close to the land, enjoying the land, and you know, in a lot of cases, growing their own food and knowing where their food comes from. And then community, you know, not not digital communities, which is, but like, but real physical proximity to people and having relationships where you, you know, where you can reach out and, and just touch the person across from you and the table and, 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 and their families a lot, you know, there's this, I, I think this idea, at least in the United States that, you know, to be successful, you want to move away from home and start your life somewhere else. But in the case of the, these men that we were filming with and these families that we were filming with, like they live in the same communities that they were born in. And, and even their their children had done the same and their grandchildren in a lot of cases were doing the same and sometimes they'd all live together in a big house and and you you look at how much how rich that made their lives and i guess it made i, I think it made both of us really kind of you know look back at our own lives and see the things that you know that maybe we we don't have as much as as we could have and and it's hard it's hard it's 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 not I don't think you see those things and immediately your life completely transforms because bringing nature into your life requires these days, it really requires a lot of work, strip, taking technology out of your life. It's, it, it sounds like it should be easy, but, but it's not, it's really difficult. So I don't know, for, for me at least, it's, it's kind of an ongoing, ongoing conversation about how to get closer to some of these things that the people we filmed with have. Before we wrap, the last thing I wanted to, to get out of you on, on all of this, I think everyone is probably wondering is you mentioned uh, you were sort of in, you knew you were in with these guys when they shaved a truffle for you. So having what I can only imagine is a transcendent kind of, <laughs> of culinary experience, is it even possible for you to go to a restaurant somewhere else or, you know, to <laughs> oil and slather it on your food or, or is there no going back after this? Well, we did, one of the things we learned was that truffle oil is not real. We, we did that with, it's all, it's a, it's a, it's, Mind it's a blown. chemical. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. that little pot, that little third on the bottom, but whatever, it's just like a chemical and it's some cheap olive oil. That, that's what, that's what we learned. Um, well, you know, we, because our truffle judge was with us a lot and uh, this man, 
having lunch with this man. He was a wine taster for 10 years and a cheese taster for eight years and a chocolate taster for 10 years and now a truffle smeller for like 12 years. <laughs> this guy taught us a lot about it. the truffle would come to the table at these little places we're eating. He would squeeze it, smell it, you know, ask about the hit. He knew everything about it just by a sense of smell. So I think, yeah, we, we learned a lot. And I think, um, you know, we were fortunate enough to be with these truffle hunters. We never had a really pay for one uh, restaurant. They were always kind of handing it to us as like a little gift at the end, which was kind of nice. Um, and that's another thing we learned too, that they, a lot of times that's their currency. When you go to a doctor, like when you see Carlo at that doctor and he's, you know, he just had fallen down a hill and got whacked in the head with a big branch. He gives a doctor, you don't see that in that, in that part of the clip, but he, he gives the doctor a truffle at the end. You know, and the same with a priest. There's an always meeting with priests for Christmas and at Christmas they pull out and he says, please, you have to get it to rain because there'll be a prayer for rain. And there's these big ceremonies. Like when you see him praying over a dog, that's a big ceremony and then praying for rain, but it lasts forever, the ceremony. And then at the end, they come in the back of the chamber and give the, give the priest the trumpet. Like, no, we really, really want it to rain. Really. You know? <laughs> and, the, and the priest goes, ah, you know, he's, he's elated at the smell of it, you know, the trouble. So. so to answer your question, I think, yeah, I don't, I don't think we, hopefully we don't have to eat a fancy restaurant to get a truffle, but we can pick one up ourselves. And that, that's another thing. Luca thinks it's going to be very easy to get a truffle. No way. A truffle dog, truffle land is not going to do it. It, it takes, it takes like a hundred years to learn. These guys have diaries and charts handed from their great grandfathers of what these things are hidden. It ain't going to happen. It's just saying that. <laughs> Those are fitting <laughs> words right there. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, thank you both for being here for this extensive conversation and for the beautiful. Thank you so much. Good luck to you. Thanks, yeah, thank you, you too. Appreciate it. Thanks, Eric. Yeah.